I've been playing around in the Godot 4 Alpha for a couple of weeks now, and I wanted to cover a couple of my key takeaways from that experience to help you when you're getting up and running in the lovely Cutting Edge Alpha. So first things first, input itself has been changed up a fair bit. If I roll over to project settings and I go to the input map, you'll see I've got a couple of actions that I've added here, but normally when you come to this page, it's empty. And that's because a bunch of the default actions that were always present in a project by default have been hidden away behind a little toggle. In the top right, you can see the show built-in actions toggle. If I click that, we get access to all the stuff you'll be familiar with, like UI accept when you're confirming stuff, UI up and down for the arrow keys, all of that stuff. And there's an absolute ton of extra default actions that have been added as well. I assume this is used by the editor itself when it's listening to your inputs. I might be wrong there, though. But a bunch of the default keyboard behavior is already mapped to actions from the get-go. And you can also see there's a couple of modifiers and stuff that's been added to make it quite a slick new experience. If I do my new action, and then I click the plus button, we get an input panel that lets us either manually select from a bunch of different input types, or it will listen to what I'm doing on the keyboard as before, but it's also got extra alt, control, and shift options. So G, if I just set it to G, you can see we get the option for pressing G while holding alt, while holding shift, while holding control, meta key, anything else. And one of the other key changes to inputs is that there's an additional way of retrieving a specific type of input from the player that's really helpful. If you created one of the default examples of a kinematic body, it comes with a script for getting input from the user and it uses this new function. And that is the input.getVector. If I jump over to one of my examples of this, integrate forces, I have a function for getting the movement direction from the player. Input.getVector takes a left direction, a right direction, a forward direction, and a back direction, and it returns a vector with the amount you want to move left or right and the amount you want to move forward or back based on those inputs. What you used to have to do was over a couple of lines, you'd have to say the x-axis I want to move is input.move left minus input.move right, and for forward and back I want to do input.move forward minus input.move back, and you would end up with a vector describing a direction you can move. That's all condensed down into one function now, which is quite slick and I'm quite happy with, and it's also got some extra dead space information that you can tweak to your heart's content. So that's some really cool changes on the input side of things, and it also ties into vectors. There have been a significant number of changes in the world of 2D and 3D vectors. To start with, there are integer versions of both vector 2s and vector 3s, so that's if you don't want decimal places in the values you're handling. That's a really nice addition to have, but some of the existing functions have changed their nomenclature, so you'll need to figure out the right function names to use now and not get hung up on using the old ones. So if I jump over to clamp, in general the clamping function will limit a value to be between a minimum and a maximum, and it will make sure it can't below, go below the minimum and it can't go above the maximum. This isn't what clamp used to do, clamp used to just keep it below a maximum when it was the function attached to vectors. So now clamp works as intended, we have a minimum and a maximum value that it interacts with, but if you want to keep it just below a maximum, there's now a distinct function called limit length. And as said before, this just keeps your vector below a maximum length. That's very handy, and I use it on a couple of my dynamic functions in my player script over here. If we go over to my process function, I have a couple of lines, and what they're dedicated to is when your player moves around, it moves the location of the shoulders with you, so you get some indication uh, in the visuals of where the sword is that you're moving left, right, forward, or back. And what that does is it takes the actual direction the player's moving in, and then it limits it to a maximum of 0 0.1, so that you can tell the direction that they're trying to move in, and then we get a vector that's a much more sensible unit for us. I use a couple of the other functions that have been renamed here as well. I love lerping things, it's short for linear interpolation. In general, in GDScript, there's a global function called lerp, and it takes a value and another value and a third value, and the third value says how close we want 
our output to be to the first parameter or the second parameter, and we sort of go a fraction of the way from the first to the second. Lerp has changed and it no longer accepts any variable. You used to be able to pass in a vector and it would lerp that as well. Now it only lerps floats. If you want to lerp a vector, it has its own built-in lerp function. And it was really frustrating because vectors used to have a function called linear interpolate, the really long way of saying lerp, and that worked the same way. So there was no reason to use linear interpolate over lerp because linear interpolate is about, it's a bunch of characters longer, there's really no point. Well, now we have to use lerp, but at least it's got the short name so we don't have to have really long lines of code for it. While I'm here, you can see some of the really cool additions, which is fancy new ligatures. You can see in the type declaration of the return value of my process function, instead of a hyphen and a greater than symbol, we have an actual arrow being displayed. And that's a ligature, that's an extra ASCII character that has ad been added to show extra logical operations or to just describe things a bit more clearly. Many people don't like change, I appreciate that, especially things like this not equal to symbol, which is a bit much. I quite like the ligatures, but if you don't like them, it is available as an option in editor settings to just disable it and just keep using whatever the standard characters are. And you can find that in editor settings. And if you just search ligature, you'll see that we get code font contextual ligatures, and we can disable contextual ligatures. Although me getting to editor settings does lead into another nice new feature that we have, which is the command palette. If I click on editor up here, just below editor settings is command palette, also brought up by control shift P. Let's try that now. Control shift P. The command palette is a bunch of useful frequent features and menus you'll go to. So you can hit control shift P, type the name of it and hit enter to just open them up. And you can also see whatever the shortcuts are for that specific feature on the right. So if I want to go to editor settings, I can hit control shift P and type editor settings and then I'm there. So that's a very nice new feature as well. A bit of a more helpful change that's gone on is the way angles are treated now. There's been a reasonable overhaul to what was going on with angles because it was a little all over the place previously. What happened was every node had, well every node 2D at least, and some other ones had two properties dedicated to what their rotation was. You had rotation, which is in radians, which mathematicians love, and rotation degrees, which is in degrees, which most people know, so it's convenient to have access to rotation degrees. In an effort to reduce redundancy, there's now only rotation in radians, which means if you're interacting with the angles, you do need to know a bit more about translating between degrees and radians, which is done with the deg2rad function. And you just need to be aware of that. In fact, if I jump over to Node3D, and I search degrees, and I go over to degrees, Note, unless otherwise specified, all methods that have angle parameters must have angles specified in radians. To convert degrees to radians, use globalscope.deg2rad. Although there is the learning curve to understanding how radians work, it is very useful to have everyone being on the same page about the units they're talking about when they're dealing with rotations, and it's going to lead to a lot fewer errors where people change a rotation by an amount, and because they're using degrees it rotates far more than they're expecting. So there have been a couple of key renames that need to be addressed. One in particular is yield get tree idle frame. Idle frame has been completely renamed, that's now called process frame, and also at the same time yield has been replaced with a wait, as I've mentioned in other videos. So if we jump over into a scene with a script on it, we can go and check how that looks in script. And now if I run that, you can see in the output it waited a frame and then it printed. In the same vein as that, os.getTix milliseconds has been renamed as well. Well, I say renamed, it hasn't actually been renamed, it's been moved, which is quite confusing the first time I came across it, but hey, that's why I'm here and telling you. So os.getTix msec tells you how many milliseconds have elapsed since the program started running, which is very useful information to be able to tell animations and the like. So in our case, if we wanted to get access to this time, we would use this time singleton instead. And if I run that, 
we now get the current number of milliseconds that have elapsed printing out every frame. The last thing I want to have a little nose at that will help you in particular is a change of a name of a key function for instancing scenes. When you have a packed scene and you want to instance that in another one, say you're creating a bullet, what you would previously do is you would either preload or export a packed scene, and you would use the instance function on that packed scene to create a new copy of that node in your scene tree you can add as a child somewhere. Instance got renamed, which I've not thought about it too much, I assume it's something to do with tenses, but instead of saying instance, you now say instantiate. So if I jump over to my player script, and I jump down to a spot where I spawn some particles. We have a pack scene here, blood particles, and we run the instantiate method on it, and that returns a new child, and we add that. So if you're creating a new scene and you're trying to figure out why instance isn't working, there's your reason, it's instantiate. So if I jump in game, and I hit up, it will instance those blood particles. And that's showing off some of the lovely GPU height map stuff, which I will cover another time.